Great. I'm going to go into presentation mode. Right. So um, anyway, my name is Chris Hunting Ford. I work for Microsoft as a partner technology architect. And essentially, my role is to articulate the value of product to various partners and independent software vendors and how they could potentially use it in their business. My area of expertise, so I've been working with Dynamics 365 for more than 10 years. Um, got a little bit of experience there. Also, a ex-Microsoft MVP. Um, now, obviously, working for the mothership, it's been it's been a bit of a it's interesting experience. But <laughs> today, what we're going to focus on is how do you provide immediate business value with the Microsoft Power Platform? And I'll be going into a little bit around what that is and how it works. But in today's session, um, feel free to ask questions. More than happy to more than happy to dive in if need be. Also, what we'll do is we'll start off from a more sort of business focused perspective, and then we'll move from that to a little bit more technical. So. There's something in here for everyone, and um, hopefully you'll enjoy it. And please also feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and um, I can also answer questions there. Right, so interesting stat is that, and I will I will explain to you what the product is shortly, don't worry, but interesting stat in when you look at activity, um, sorry, when you look at application, application platform as a service, at the moment, the market is worth 14.3 billion, okay? In 2022, Gartner and Forrester have rejected it to go to one over $32 billion. And that means that application platform as a service is probably the most, the biggest rising star in all of the as a service sort of functions. So if you think about infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, application platform as a service is essentially a mechanism to use low code or no code to create applications. So there's a number of people out there that do this, such as Mendix, Salesforce Lightning Platform, and obviously the Microsoft Power Platform, which is the leader at the moment. So in Microsoft, essentially, uh, we have three core cloud areas that we work with, um, one of them being Azure, the next one being uh, what we call M365, or the Office Stack, and then the third one being Business Applications. Essentially, um, Power Platform is considered the fourth cloud, and it's the one that weaves into all of the other clouds, right? So there's things from Azure within the Power Platform, there's functionality from Microsoft Office 365, um, and the modern workplace, as well as business applications. And that's how seriously they are taking it. It's um, the Microsoft Corp team and our CEO, Sachin Adela, have basically said that it's caught what we're doing as a company. Ooh, which is absolutely amazing. I just want to make sure I haven't gone on hold real quick. Nope. Okay, there's just somebody in the lobby. That's fine. Let's get back to the presentation. Right. So, if you take a look at the Gartner and Forrester charts, you can see that the Microsoft um, low-code application platform has been in the top right for some time now. Um, in fact, we're leading, um, leading as far as, far as um, you know, Salesforce and Mendix go, which is really amazing. Um, the, the solution's actually been around for a little bit longer than you think. A lot of people assume this is quite new for Microsoft, but actually the core fundamental bits of the application are very old and they're very mature and they've been around for a long time. They've had a lot of work put into them. They've just been linked together to create the Power Platform. And there's a lot of customers, obviously my favorite being Lego, because I just think Lego's epic, but um, very important that this is a leading provider globally. So let's talk a little bit about what it is. Essentially, when um, when you talk to customers and partners and, and organizations all over the world, you know, there's a lot of issues that they face and a lot of challenges. And it's quite, quite scary because when you look at statistics, um, the number of enterprises with more than 100 terabytes of data, of unstructured data, has doubled since 2016. That's absolutely crazy. I was actually, I was actually kind of um, thinking about this the other day, that all of us, every single one of us on our machines right now, we probably have spreadsheets or Word documents that we're not sharing with others and we're not, you know, leveraging. And you know that of all the people, of all these businesses globally, only 32% of those companies are actually succeeding in analyzing that data, which is crazy. Only 32% of them are leveraging that data in an analytical manner. They are, only 32% of them are creating what we call actionable insights off the back of that data. So they're capturing data, they're just not using it, which is, which is terrifying. Next thing that was quite interesting was um, if you think about the way you got to work today or if you're working from home or you're from your office, uh, I took a train. So I woke up this morning and um, I opened up social media and I opened up my email, opened up our CRM system to see what was going on. And what I found very interesting is the fact that we just assume that our solutions that we create now are going to be flexible enough to work on every single device that we own. So we just assume that, okay, well, 
our um our apps that we create will be will be per, will work perfectly fine on mobile devices as well as laptops. When you connect it to your email via your phone, and then you went and moved over to your laptop a little bit later in the day, um, you just assumed that everything would synchronize. Uh, I remember when I was in South Africa, I launched Windows Phone there, and um, I remember freaking out in front of a thousand people because the data wasn't synchronizing from my phone to my laptop. But now you just take that for granted. Now you just assume that that's what's going to happen. And actually, a good app experience will kind of that, that's what a, a great app experience will, will give you is the ability to completely flexibly move between devices. And um, they were talking about over 72% of the US workforce will be mobile workers by 2020. And that's not just the US. I mean, that's that this is obviously an American slide, but the stat is global. And I think it's probably more than 72%, actually, if you look at it realistically, because people are working far more flexibly and people are looking to work far more flexibly. You want to be able to move directly from your phone to your laptop to your desktop if you really need to. And the time spent on your mobile phone is now much, much higher than working on a PC. And that's because mobile phones have gotten very, very you know, technically advanced. The other thing that we found with most businesses is that apps can be very, very expensive to create. So actually building apps can cost a lot of money. And um, when you look at platforms like, um, oh, sorry, I've lost, I've lost the word right now. It's, um, oh, I'll think of it now, sorry. Um, so when you, look at, when you look at application platforms, normally they can cost quite a lot. So when people have to develop the apps, it can be uh, quite expensive. And it means that a lot of code, a lot of time, and what I call a lot of technical debt. And essentially it's very difficult to update those platforms, right? What the Power Platform does is it kind of mitigates that, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Something that's really interesting, though, is that customers and businesses, right, and this is not, not just a partner stat, this is a customer stat, is that most businesses, um, when they're looking at technology projects, 81% of those projects are influenced by line of business decision makers. So if you think about, like, an insurance company, and they have um, a claims department and a policy department, they don't, you know, they don't necessarily need to use the same system, but the line of business leader within those departments is basically going to choose the technical solution, right? And that's really important because those are the types of people we need to be talking to. And if you're a customer on the call, you know exactly what I'm talking about from this perspective. You want to have a solution that works within your business. And often, actually, when you look at this type of thing, um, line of business decision makers, because of the, the rate of change within companies, um, they, they'll go into uh, downloading their own solutions or creating their own solutions. And often this leads to shadow IT, which I'll explain shortly. But it's very important to understand that this is happening right now. So a couple of interesting um, points, right? When you're looking to help a business transform, or even if you're a customer on the call, when you're looking to transform your business, there's always this battle between business and IT. Um, I've been in many, many calls and many, many meetings where the business team haven't agreed with the IT team, and often there's a lot of a, there's a lot of conflict. And there's a couple of reasons. You know, the business will often say, "We've got massively complex process, and there's lots of paper processes we need to we need to be fixing, and there's a lot of things we need to change." And you know, all our processes are way too complicated. And IT is going, "Well, you know, guys, that's that's true, but we just don't have time and resource to help you. We don't have the budget to sort out these these issues. You know, just keep on using Excel." And it's quite scary because in most IT in most IT organizations, the budget gets spent pretty quickly um, and the business don't often get the benefit because they, IT are so busy building our platform and security and compliance and not actual line of business systems. So it totally makes sense that um, you know the business and IT would have these types of challenges. And I know I remember when I worked, I've been a customer of Microsoft, I've worked for Microsoft and I've worked as a partner for Microsoft. And um, it's been very interesting where in all three scenarios, I've experienced the exact same type of issues. The other interesting one is around, you know, when you think about something called shadow IT governance, I don't know if any of you know what that is, but um, it actually results in a lot of business expectations changing. So what happens is uh, in most organizations, you'll have a line of business manager who needs some help and needs a software solution. And what they'll do is they'll ask IT, IT will say we don't have time and budget, what the, line of, what the line of business decision maker will do is then go into the internet and download something like Zoho CRM or Sugar CRM or one of the other free packages out there and implement that internally. The issue is, is IT don't know about that, right? And that's the scary part. If IT don't know, how can you provide governance? How can you provide compliance? How can you manage that solution? How can you get to that data? And that's, that's incredibly interesting where shadow IT governance basically means 
IT not having the ability to manage the applications that are within the application stack of the business. So think about this, right? I'm going to give you a saying. The saying is, better a governed free market that you know than a black market that you don't know. So I talk about this type of saying all the time. So I'll repeat it again. Better a governed free market that you know than a black market you don't know. Okay. And if you're an IT person, think about that very carefully. If you're not an IT person on the call, and if you're the one downloading all these custom, all these random applications, I want to tell you that you're not contributing to helping IT. You're making it worse for them. And the reason for that is you're not giving your business the right data, You're not, and therefore you're not providing in, um, insights. And that brings me to my next point. What often happens in businesses is that because IT don't know about these solutions that are out there, and because IT don't know what's happening, how are they supposed to get to the data? And the, business, and the business often complain that there's a lack of tracking and measuring performance. So how is their business supposed to govern and manage what's happening within, um, within, with all that data? And the thing that I find very interesting is that often the business will go to IT and say, look, you know, we need a power BI system, we need a BI system, or we need a, a, a performance tool metric management system. And IT will go, well, look, you know, we don't know the systems in our business. So there's lack of insights. And the biggest issue leads to legacy system maintenance maintaining all these very, very old solutions. And that can often be quite tough. Um, interesting fact, so I'm an ex-Delphi developer. I used to work for Borland many years ago. And um, I, I wrote some interesting systems for like time management and fleet management and all sorts of things. And unfortunately, the businesses that I wrote those for, since Delphi is very, very, um, not, not as widely used as it was, unfortunately, the businesses have to manage those solutions and hire people that understand the coding language. Other things that are really key is around security and compliance. Every single one of you on this call, if you're into technology, you know right now that security and compliance is one of the largest contributing factors to IT choosing systems and business wanting systems. Think about things like GDPR, right? Got to be compliant. Think about things like audit. You need to be compliant. Very, very key to understanding exactly what's going on within business. And then interestingly enough, here's something very cool. So I'm going to leave on a high note on this one is that Actually, a lot of the solutions that could help you, you probably own or already exist. And um, what actually happens is that most customers using things like Office 365 don't know that they have access to Power Apps, right? Or don't know that they have access to all these amazing solutions that could help them out. Which brings me on to my next point. When you look at the Microsoft Power Platform, this is the exact type of solution that can help you with this type of these types of challenges. The Microsoft Power Platform is Microsoft's core platform that focuses on three core areas within the product stack. Those three core areas are Microsoft Power BI, and I'll talk about each one of these separately, on Microsoft Power BI, Power Apps, and Microsoft Flow. Power BI provides the insights, Power Apps provides the business logic on top of the data, and Microsoft Flow provides the automation. These three areas are intimately connected with the three office cloud, the three clouds, which is Dynamics 365, Business Applications Cloud, the Office 365, which is essentially the modern workplace, and Microsoft Azure. You can also link them up to your current line of business applications. So if you really wanted to and you didn't want to switch out those applications, you just wanted to add to them, you could absolutely do that just connecting through the common data service or connectors. Very, very key. Underneath all of that, though, you've got a couple of core areas. You've got the data connectors, which help you do your connections to various areas of the business. Your AI builder, this is artificial intelligence, which we'll drill into a little bit later. And then the common data service, which is essentially a database in the cloud and provides you a mechanism to create relational databases that are managed and governed uh, through security and compliance. So that's the Power Platform, very key. The Power Platform, each one of these areas has actually been around for a little while. So Microsoft Flow is built on top of a thing called Logic Apps which is an um, integration, uh, integration automation tool. You've got Power Apps, which is actually built using Dynamics 365, their, um, their application framework, as well as Canvas Apps, which came from Modern Workplace, and then Power BI, which came from Apps and Infra. And Power BI is essentially the visual mechanism to understanding data. The Common Data Service also came from Dynamics 365, and actually, they democratized it. So Microsoft Corp actually ripped out the, the um, XRM framework, so not just extend, not just customer relationship management, but any kind of relationship management. They ripped that out and basically democratized it and gave us the ability to leverage that as the database tool. It is not access in the cloud. It is not SQL in the cloud. 
it is a massive combination of various tools that create this common data service layer for us. And we'll talk about what, what that looks like shortly. So when we start kind of looking into each area, let's take a look at Power Apps first. So the low code approach to creating applications. It's really great because it allows you to easily build out these amazing web applications that are web and mobile applications that are can that can be accessed across devices. So when you think about um, like leveraging PowerPoint in Excel, it's a very similar experience, um, very WYSIWYG. So you can drag and drop components and elements onto a form. And that's the Canvas app experience. The model driven application experience is slightly different. We're looking at a thing called forms over data. And essentially what that means is this is a real like business process driven approach to creating an application framework or application experience. Very important to understand that you can connect these apps to over 260 pre, uh, pre -built, uh, with, with 260 pre-built connectors. You can connect them to loads of other systems. So if you're running Oracle, SAP or Salesforce, no problem. You can connect to those directly through the application connector. Very, very strong enterprise governance and security. So if you're not an Active Directory user, you may uh, you may get grant access to the application as a guest. However, there's a lot of security around this. So not from an AD perspective, but also from a user roles perspective, you can even limit the experience that users have with fields on the app using security. What it'll also do is allow you to use your current device peripherals. So things like your GPS and your camera, um, and those are kind of exist out the box, right? So you can just connect to those. And there's lots of scenarios where we use the camera to take photos of various things. Very, very great experience, but it uses what's available directly out the box. So that's the Power Apps piece. When you look at Microsoft Flow, the way that I explain Flow is a bit like the engine of the car. So where Power Apps is the body of the car, it's kind of like this is where you use, this is where you put your key, this is where you drive, these are the pedals. Flow is the engine, and it, it allows you to create these amazing automations within your business that cross platforms. So as an example, um, what you could do is you could create a flow for an approval that looks at Salesforce or looks at Dynamics. It doesn't matter. You know, flow can look at anything. But it's very important to understand that you're able to use flow to automate as many as many tasks as possible, and it goes cross-platform. One of the things that I love, though, is uses those pre-built connectors again. So those same connectors that you're using with the, um, with the Canvas apps, you can use with Microsoft Flow. Very important to understand that Flow is also used as a interfacing tool. And when I say that, I'm not using the term integration because integration means movement and augmentation of data. Interfacing doesn't. Interfacing means just simple movements of data in the same in the same state. So it's a very easy way to move data around various applications. So Flow is really Flow is one of the one of the most widely used tools within the Power Platform. Very very important that I uh, I would say it's it's one of the core areas to focus on from a bit from the beginning. Power BI, so Power BI is amazing. Power BI, I apologize for the noise, everyone is um, just in the middle of a hallway. <laughs> Power BI is a really, really great mechanism to, under to use to understand data, right? So in most businesses, what happens is that, um, you know, you print out a report in a spreadsheet or a, a merged, a mail merged Word documents, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting great access to data. What Power BI does is it allows you to visualize that data in a more sort of interactive and appealing format. You can connect to pretty much any data source you want. So you don't need to just connect to Dynamics. You can connect to SAP, Oracle, if you really wanted to. And uh, what's great is that it works directly with Microsoft Flow and Power Apps and all of those tools. So it works intimately with the rest of the, the Power Platform stack. Great tool around leveraging things like Azure Data Services, right? So you can use SQL Data, data Warehouse. Um, you can use Azure Data Lake. A really, really great mechanism to optimizing those analytics. And the interesting part about this is that it's very sort of pixel perfect. So what you can do is you can create these amazing solutions, these amazing dashboards that display data in such an interactive way. Um, I found that Power BI is probably one of the first tools I used within the Power Platform stack because it really gave me the opportunity to really understand the data within my business. And you can see on the right hand side, there's some amazing little uh, amazing examples of where Power BI works really well. Moving on to the common data service. So this for me is one of the core areas of the Power Platform, massively important. Uh, the, the common data service is the mechanism to storing data. So what you can do is it's, it's a bit more than a database, right? It kind of allows you to create an out the box backend for applications. And what that means is that an app, is, an app that you build is only as good as the data in that app, right? So if you don't have the right security privileges, if you don't have the right information, the application will be useless and it supports 
multiple backends, right? So you've got different areas within the common data service. You've got a relational database that's SQL, that's uh, essentially SQL. You've got Azure Blob Stories. You've even got Cosmos DB, and the data gets split up between those various areas. Very important to understand that this is very secure, right? So very similar to the way in which you manage um, the security in SQL. It has that component, but this is very much role-based. So you can create user roles and actually limit the entities and what that people will see. It also gives you a really great jump start to creating data models. So I'm going to say something that might upset you. SharePoint is not a relational database. Stop using it as one. Okay. SharePoint lists are created to store information in list format. Lists are not relational. Okay. This is a relational database. It allows you to interlink tables or entities and create that relational type structure. So if you think about like parent child relationships, one parent may have many children. Okay. You can create those types of relationships inside the common data service where you can't do that in SharePoint. Okay. SharePoint has a very, very strong use case, but from a relational perspective, common data service is the right way to go. What it does, though, is um, actually Dynamics was built on top of the common data service. So if you look at the way that Microsoft Dynamics customer engagements is built, sales service marketing field service, that is underpinned by the common data service. And we call those first party applications, right? Great thing about CDS, common data service, is that you've got multiple ways to move data in and out of the CDS. So you've got an integration tier where you can actually move data uh, between points. So you've got the data sync functionality. What you've also got is the API layer. So you've got um, your SOAP and REST API connectors. There's an OData API that essentially um, exposes the data through OData, uh, the information through OData. There's a huge set of authentication rules. So very, very secure, very strong. For me, it, it was a similar experience to designing those relational tables in Access. So they've made it very simple, but it's a very complex backend. So what you get for your money is huge. Second to last little bit of the common, of the Power Platform is your data connectors. Data connectors are very key. So what the data connectors let you do is actually connect to over 260 other cloud services. So if you think like SurveyMonkey, Salesforce, Facebook, Twitter, these connectors exist, right? And it's very, very easy to connect to those data sources directly from Canvas apps or using these, these data connectors. One of the things that Microsoft are continuously doing is adding. So they just keep on adding more and more and more to these data connectors. One of the things that I found very useful, though, is the ability to connect to on-premise data solutions, right? So there's an on-prem data gateway that you can use to actually integrate your on-premise data directly through to the common data service. So great mechanism to do that. Um, if you'd really like to move data between your on-prem and online solutions, you can do it. It's very, very simple. Awesome part is that you can create your own connectors. So if you know a little bit of coding, um, you don't necessarily need to code. You can create connectors without code, but are very useful. So if you've got an application that um, exists in your business that you know you need to write a connector for, you can easily do that. And um, you could even monetize those if you really wanted to. So that's the Power Platform. So I will talk about the AI piece shortly, but just to recap, just to recap, You've got Power BI, which is your analytical layer. You've got Power Apps, which is your business logic layer, your application layer, where the users will actually put data in and leverage data. You've got Microsoft Flow, which is essentially the engine. It's the automation layer. You've got the common data service, which is your mechanism to store data and create data models. You've got data connectors, which allow you to link up to other systems. And we're going to talk about the AI builder now. But those are your core areas of the Power Platform. Okay. So let's take a look at AI. So the AI piece is a little bit is a little bit weird, and um, people people often speak to me about AI as if it's something that um you know doesn't exist, and it's and it and it, and it really is just a myth. So we're going to de defunct that a little bit. So first of all, most businesses that I talk to assume that AI is far too complicated, and they won't ever have the right use case to using AI. And it's interesting because a lot of the time a business might say that, but they might even be using AI without without even knowing it. And um, I've seen that a number of times where I walk into a customer and they, they get a bit scared of AI, but it turns out that it's actually being used within the business somewhere. So we, we'll defunct that a little bit later. Another fact is most businesses assume that they don't have the skills to internally uh, create AI or create AI solutions or leverage AI tools, which also not is not necessarily the case because the way that Microsoft have built out the artificial intelligence tools, they've democratized it, making it a lot more simple for people like us to just get our hands on artificial intelligence. 
And then interesting part, uh, I thought I'd include a picture of the Terminator because uh, when when Terminator was first released, people freaked out. They they were really really terrified that artificial intelligence was going to take over the world. And I remember when the Matrix was released as well. Um, people people freaked out and they thought that machines were going to take over and that's not AI right I mean sure it's in the movies it is but um it often scares organizations and the reason is because it's a bit like watching a horror movie you can see the you know when there's a ghost in the house and they show those those movies you can see the door moving it's what's moving the door which is scaring people and they don't often understand what AI does so I remember going to customers and my boss said to me this is when I was at a partner, and then he said to me, hey, you know what? You need to go and sell AI. So I said, okay, cool. No problem. I'll go sell, sell AI. So I went into customers, and I'm like, hey, do you want to buy some AI? And they said, sure. What is it? And I went, I don't know, because I wasn't sure exactly what it was or how it worked. Um, and that's purely because I didn't understand what the back end looked like, what it looked like underneath all those amazing layers. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So interesting things uh, around the Power Platform. AI is deeply embedded. So interesting part is that it's probably you probably have encountered artificial intelligence in some form whether you know it or not and that's really interesting because if you think about your everyday lives you probably have seen some form of artificial intelligence and you have literally no clue that it's that it's happened right and this is also true when using the power platform because when you're using the power platform when you create an application that uses ai to pick and create parts of the app and that's built underneath. When you're using what we call the accessibility checker, AI basically looks at the interface and can understand what's going on and why your app is not or is accessible. You've got the AI builder, which is essentially democratized artificial intelligence using cognitive services and embedded in the power, in the power platform. And then you've got the key influences within Power BI. So those Power BI widgets that you use essentially have AI embedded and they can help you really understand what's going on from our, with your data. So I would say that AI is definitely all around us. It's making things we would normally spend hours and hours doing much simpler, kind of pushing us to use our brains a bit better. So if you think about things like data capture, before you'd actually have to hire somebody to go and like put in, uh, input information into fields, it's not really the case anymore, right? What you can do over here is you've got the, th this allows you the ability to say, well, um, let's make things automated. Let's make things simpler. And let's give people the opportunity to really think and undertake tasks that they really want to. So the first one is the Power Apps Builder. Um, in And I will show you guys this live. When you create an application within the Power Platform, right, it actually, it actually uses the AI to understand the data that you've got in the common data service. It tries to understand the field, the various fields that you have and what fields are used most versus least. And it'll actually build your app for you to a certain extent. It'll create a framework. And um, we'll show you that shortly. The app checker, so this is one of the apps I was building the other day. The app checker, you can see on the right-hand side, it says accessibility. It actually tells you if the app is going to be relevant to people with accessibility uh, issues. So if you're blind or if you're deaf, you know, you might not be able to use certain software solutions. The, the solution will actually tell the builder whether that's going to be the case or not. So it actually alerts you of, the, of what's accessible and what's not. So there's some amazing AI builder um, scenarios that you can look at. Um, and this is the AI builders, the democratized version of cognitive services within the Power Platform. So leveraging data within the Power Platform, you've got what we call binary classification. And it kind of determines the likelihood of, of, business, of business outcomes based on data that you've got inside the common data service. So as an example, if you ran a marketing campaign, you can use AI to tell what future marketing campaigns will be effective based on data from previous ones. One of my favorite ones is the form processing. So you can read and extract information from forms like emails and PDFs and um, store, create transactional data records and store that information. So the example I'll give is that if you've got like an electricity bill, you can scan that in and actually grab that data directly from that form and store it inside the common data service. You've got the object detection. This one's amazing. So the use case around the object detection actually is uh, being able to take a photo and using AI understand the information in the photo. And there's a, there's a use case with a company called PepsiCo. So they sell Pepsi and they want to have their bottles on every retailer's shelf. And what actually happens is that um, often their competing brands like Coca-Cola want more shelf space than them. And um, the have, they have inspectors that have to go in and take photos of where the Pepsi cans are on the shelf. And it basically picks up what's a Pepsi can and what's not. 
Um, they've even there's even a solution out there that describes pictures to blind people through object detection. It's absolutely amazing. Another great one is the text classification. So it's able to read a lot. It enables you to kind of scan certain blobs of text and then tag it. And then it uses those future tags based on the blocks of blobs of text you've tagged um, to create and classify certain things like sentiment analysis or um, uh, you know categorization of, of incidents. Really, really great solution. And then they've got the good old business card reader. And that's just I think that's just an added bonus. We've been whinging about business card readers forever in Microsoft Dynamics. <laughs> and um, what's great is that they've actually finally included that from an AI perspective. So you can just take a photo of a business card and um, what that'll do is it'll then store that information as uh, as transactional data. So it's all very exciting. And here's a just a quick view of what it actually looks like. So when, and I will show you this live. So what you can do is you can actually just log in directly into Power Platform, open up and open up the set of applications and start kind of going through. You can basically create your own models and I'll show you one of the models I've created. One of my favorite ones is the key influences in Power BI. So um, Power BI, they they have the, this amazing widget that basically looks at data, understands data, and then feeds back information around what the key influences are around this data. So I was doing um, UFO spotting. So in the US, <laughs> they've logged lots of UFO sightings. So I basically said, if you look at the key influences, it's 1.6 times um, more likely that if somebody sees a UFO in the in the US, it's going to be shaped like a fireball. Absolutely crazy. And that's by country, right? So how do we get started? Well, there's a couple of things I want to tell you guys before. Okay, so the awesome thing about Power Platform is that there is an app for everyone. So if you're a citizen developer, if you want to get started building up applications yourself and you don't have any um, any technical knowledge, not a problem. You can actually start building out your own apps um, you know, as a citizen developer. And the way we frame citizen developers is basically a subject matter export, right? So somebody that expert, somebody that really, really understands what's going on in their business, but really needs to have the ability to articulate that from a software perspective. And um, essentially what happens is a citizen developer really has the ability to create these apps without using any code. So the story here is um, at Heathrow Airport, there was a security guard by the name of Samit. And uh, Samit, uh, you know, thought that there were some of the things, some things that were not quite working with the security side of things. So he built a couple of applications. And now he's basically leading the, the charge from a app a built perspective at Heathrow Airports. And he knows no code. He doesn't know how to code, right? What about developers, though? So I know some of you on the call might be developers. Don't worry. Perfect. So my friend, um, a, name, a lady by the name of Manuela, works at, works at Virgin Atlantic, and Manuela is a developer. She's actually just started working at Microsoft now. And Manuela started writing applications that assisted Virgin in doing things like airplane inspections and seat allocation. And what was great was that she was a coder. She wrote code. That was her thing. Um, but she was able to build out these amazing applications. And now she's the UI queen, which is absolutely amazing. So she builds beautiful applications. So there's some amazing stories out there. And I'd encourage you to go and look on Twitter or, um, or the Microsoft sites. You'll find some very, very great information. But the important part is that when you're building applications and you're not a coder, you actually start learning some really great technical skills. But if you're a developer and you're building applications, you start learning some SME type skills and design skills. So there's there's the opportunity for everyone to build an application here. There's lots of types of apps you can build. So I've worked in pretty much most industries and I've built loads of apps. Um, these are just examples, but if you want, you can build out applications that help you with campaign management, with event check-ins, um, dealing with people that are late to take phone calls like me today. I'm sorry about that again. <laughs> um, logging cases, uh, fleets and facilities management. There's so many applications that you can build and you're limited only by your imagination. So if you really wanted to, you could create absolutely anything you'd like. Um, we've seen an app that waters that uses a raspberry pi and waters a plant. All right, it's absolutely amazing. So one of the important things is that inside your business, when you're dealing with, uh, with when you're thinking about applications, there's a couple of areas to focus on. Now you might be a customer, you might be a partner, you might not be technical, you might be technical, but like I said, there's an area for everyone here. So first of all, from an application perspective. Inside your business, whether you're helping somebody deliver Power Platform or you're doing it yourself, you need to increase user adoption by training. Teach people how to build apps. That's the easiest way of explaining it, right? Show them how to build applications. Best part about this 
is that you have the ability to enhance and build up business processes. So if you've got one of those paper processes, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but if you've got one of those that need to be digitized, absolutely no problem. But also think about your run of the mill, like it takes me five hours to do A, B, and C. Don't worry, great opportunity for you to kind of um, build out those, those, those uh, processes into a digital format. Building out cross-platform mobile applications is very key. So you can build out apps that work with Salesforce, SAP, Dynamics, whatever you'd like. It wouldn't really matter. As long as you're building apps, that's my main thing. And then obviously apply the governance and the li application lifecycle management to your apps. So making sure that your apps can move between various environments and get shared across the business really effectively. One of my favorite one, ones is um, most people have applications that are, are quite legacy. So you have the ability to customize and configure first um, third party applications and really kind of bring the user experience to a maximum or maximize the user experience. One of my favorite ones is around the dig digitization of the paper processes. One of the core areas where Power Apps really fits in well. So you have the ability to digitize those paper processes very quickly, like things such as doing inspections or, um, you know, recording event attendees, all of that's done on paper. You can digitize that whole process. And then finally looking at all the applications in your business that you can modernize using the Power Platform framework. So very important. That's one of the core, those are the core areas that we've seen people growing their businesses in. There are lots of customers using this, lots and lots and lots. So it's not just you, it's not just me, it's not just um, the guy next door. There are hundreds of people using um, Power Apps. Some of these places you'll recognize, some of them you won't. But a very key set of customers and very great customer stories out there that are publicly available. Right, so one of the ones, one of my favorite ones is Standard Bank in South Africa. So Standard Bank, um, they had issues with uh, ATMs being broken. South Africa is a bit quite, quite crazy on the crime. And um, what they ended up doing was they actually ended up building out one of these applications that allowed people to do your um, app ATM inspections. And once they'd done those inspections, they had the ability to say, okay, well, cool. You know, we'll, we'll record this information directly within the app and then we'll store that in, in a database and we'll, we'll start kind of getting people scheduled to go and fix them. So it was really ATM repair and cleanup and reduced lots of hours. So many, many weeks turned into just a few hours. It also really lowered the costs so the application build was not that expensive, but they got really great time to value. And that's because Vanessa, one of the ladies at Standard Bank, created a center of excellence. And that's the way you should start. If you're looking to build out Power Platform applications, um, the mechanism to, is to start building out that center of excellence so you can gain really great business value really fast. Building apps that are random is fine, but if you really want to kind of make sure that these apps are adopted, building out the center of excellence is one of the most important parts. So from a presentation perspective, that's kind of that done. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop into one of the environments. I know we don't have very much time left. I'm just going to shoot into one of the environments and I'm going to show you what this looks like. So if I open up um, the Power Platform or Power Apps um, suite, this is essentially where you build your applications, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of shoot back over to this slide over here. And just give you a bit of info, right? So essentially, we spoke about these three core areas. The Power Apps piece is what I'm looking at at the moment. So if I wanted to create a brand spanking new app, you can see I've created an app over here that helps me do lead management. So if I want to capture leads while I'm at a trade show, and I made this very accessible. So I made this I made sure that people that were blind could use this application. Very, very great way for me to create a new lead. We'll go Chris. London. And we're going to go email Chris dot email dot com kapow, and we'll save that to the database. Now, what's crazy is I'm going to take a bet with everyone on the call right now. I will bet you that I can create this application in less than one minute. Okay, so you might not believe me, but you can time me. So what we're going to do is to create that application. We're simply going to go create a new app. Create a Canvas app. It's going to ask me to connect to a specific data set. So I'm going to select connecting to the common data service. I'm going to select my leads entity. And I'm going to go connect. Now, remember, I told you that this uses AI. So what's actually happening in the background is that there's some artificial intelligence that's being fired off to help me create this application. Right. And it's basically saying, oh, these are the types of tables you use. There's, I did say I was going to create in under a minute, but here's my app. Right. 
Um, so what I can do is I can run my application. I can go right ahead and capture a new lead. Whoops, let's go back, press the wrong button. It may not let me save it. There you go, there's my lead saved. There's my record right over here. Super fast, right? So very, very basic application frame that I can use to build out my apps. Now, the AI was in the background doing a whole lot of stuff in there and it actually basically said, some, it, it basically looks at the fields within my system and said, okay, well, it looks like name is the one that you use the most. We're gonna, we're gonna add that. If I go to my app checker and I click that button over there, do you remember I told you about the accessibility checks? Okay, it actually will tell me if there's any issues now at the moment, I haven't named my 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 um, tools correctly. So you can see you've got accessible label. I need to call this. We're going to call this search tab out of there. And when I rerun my accessibility checker, I've only got two accessibility issues over there, and that uses artificial intelligence. So very very key. Now one of the other scenarios, I'm just going to open one of the other pages. Oops. While it's loading, one of the other, other scenarios about leveraging artificial intelligence was around using a thing called the AI Builder, which I told you guys about earlier. So as you can see, what I've done is um, I've created a bunch of artificial intelligence models that use various elements of the app. So my favorite one is the object detection, right? So if I open that up, what it allows me to do is it allows me to basically scan objects and tell me what the object is based on the, um, the way I've trained it. So if I run a quick test, I'm going to say, upload from my device. We're going to pick, pick a picture of, let's go for, um, let's go for a UFO. Whoops. Sorry, got to get into the right one. Pick a picture of a UFO. Cool, so that's gonna basically scan the image and tell me whether it's a UFO or not. So let's have a look, it may take a second. Cool, so it's 83% UFO. So that's basically decided to tell me that this is a UFO. If I start over and I pick another image, let's pick one that I drew. So I drew this the other day. To a photo. Looks really bad, I could control UFOs, apparently. Just while it's... Uh, Give it a bit of a scan. It does take a second because basically it's running through the model trying to figure out if uh, it's, it recognizes this image. Oh dear, taking a bit of time. Well, while it's doing that, I'll drill back to my presentation. So essentially that app framework, the app that I built was based on the Power Apps. I'm looking at the AI builder now. So let's hope that this, there we go, it's 92% UFO. That's awesome, All right? So it's figured out that that's a UFO. How do I embed this within my apps? Well, I'm gonna show you guys something cool. So I'm gonna pick the, uh, the UFO app I was working on the other day and we're gonna go edit. Does this allow me to edit the UFO app I was building? Great. I am connected via my, my telephone, so I can't imagine this is going to be hugely fast. There we go. So this is a very basic application. What I can do, though, is I'm going to use this as my AI screen. I'm going to go to insert. I'm going to put an AI builder. We're going to go into object detection. We're going to pick my UFO object detection detector. Make it a little bit bigger. And if I run my app, Let's check. This is embedded in the application itself. And like I said, this area is now democratized within the Power Platform. So you can leverage it at any point. There we go. It's picked up that it's a UFO. So I could use this artificial intelligence directly in my application. A couple of other forms of the AI. And I did want to show you the, the key indicators. So what I can do is I can build out my own Power BI reports. Uh, let's go to the actual reports itself. And what I can tell from a Power BI perspective, and I'm not really great at designing Power BI reports, <coughs> I've got to get, I've got to learn to get a bit better. But I'm, as you can see, these are all the UFO sightings across the globe, and I can filter by country, right? So that's the USA. 
I can filter by the type of sighting. So let's go for uh, let's go for fireball. Cool. There you go. Lots of UFO fireball sightings. The key indicators, though, basically tell me it will tell me a little bit more about the data that I've got. So what it's doing is it's looking at the states and it's saying, "Wow, in America, 1.06 one sorry in America, the likelihood of spotting a fireball shaped UFO is 1.06 times more likely than if it's a uh, shape change." UFO, and if I drill into each piece, I can actually tell the different segments, right? Really cool. So the AI functionality is deeply embedded within the Power Platform. Now, very interesting from a application build perspective. This takes no time at all. It's very easy to create these types of apps. Very simple to kind of build them out in a more kind of visual way. It gives users access to access that information. Last part I'm going to show you is around the common data service. So remember I spoke to you about this piece over here. Common data service is a really great way to place to store data. So if I go right ahead and search for UFOs, there we go, there's my UFO data over there. I actually managed to create this, so I added all of these fields. You can see I've got data in my database over here. Um, any forms that I want to use, any relationships linked up to other database, any relationships linked up to other records. But essentially, all I've basically done is given the ability to store my data in a relational database and expose it through that app layer. So essentially, all I've done is the data lives in the common data service. I'm using AI to augment that data and learn from it, but it's exposed through the Power App. So users can put in information like their lead data, and I'm using the Power BI as a reporting tool. If I wanted to, I could add in Microsoft Flow and have alerts coming off the back of it, but we're not going to do that. So to wrap up, what I wanted to tell you all is um, very, very important, right? Power Platform is very core and key to what Microsoft are doing. Very core and key. There are the three core areas of the Power Platform, which is Power BI, which is your analytics layer, Power Apps, which is your, line of, your, your um, business logic layer that lives on top of data, and Microsoft Flow, which is the automation piece. And obviously, thinking about where to put data, the common data service is normally the first answer because that is really where you know you want to interact with data and have it secure and safe in one location. Deeply embedded within all of this is artificial intelligence. So you have the ability to leverage AI as much as you need it. As I said before, I gave you examples of these two scenarios. You don't even know that you're using it. It is there and it is very visual. You've got the different AI models that you can use to connect and kind of update. But very key is that AI is not a thing that doesn't exist. It really does, and people are using it very actively. So with that, I'd like to wrap up, um, say thank you very much for having me, and open up for questions. Questions, anyone? Hi. Hello there. Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. I have one question, please. Uh, with respect to the, um, can we build custom uh, AI models, for example, to detect fraud um, based on the uh, transactions? Uh, I mean, can we train them saying these are the uh, ones that uh, analysts have detected in the past that they are fraudulent transactions? And based on that, can we uh, create models, AI models, um, saying that, um, now if you feed in the real-time data, then it will automatically flag the uh, the transactions that has potential fraud. Yeah, I mean, look, absolutely. If you um, if you're depending on the data, you would have to train mm -hmm. the model, and you could use text tagging to understand those transactions. So, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's you may you may want to spend a bit of time really just digging through that data. But yeah, it's definitely a good use case. Okay. In that case, how do how exactly do we um, how exactly do we create such a model? Can so we, what? Yeah. Very very simple. What you would do, and in fact, I'm going to reshare my screen if that's okay. Yes, please. So just give me a second. Okay, so you can see my screen, right? Yes. Great. Okay, so in models over here. Mm -hmm. What you would do is you'd go build a new model. Okay. It's going to ask you which one. What you want to do is you want to do the prediction model. Okay. Right. You could you could also do the text classification, but these two it would be one of these two. It might be a mixture of the two. You basically give, uh, give it a name, so we'll call this. Yeah. 
Now, I don't obviously have any fraud records, so I don't know. I, I don't reckon I could probably replicate what you want to do, but I could give you an example of how to start. And then what you would want to do is you'd select the entity. So your entity would probably be um, fraud detection or fraud record or, um, you know, transaction. So I'll just use UFO. Okay, I don't have any fields in here that would work. So I don't have any numeric fields that this is going to work with or, or Boolean. But um, yeah, this is probably, this is the start, right? And then you would, what you would do is you'd select the fields. You would then say the, out, the type of outcome you'd be looking for. And from that, you could kind of say, okay, well, you know, based on information ABC, this is a fraudulent record. But you would need to have something to make sure that you tag a set of records as fraudulent so that it learns. Got it. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so what I was trying to understand is uh, there are two types of models, right? Wherein you all you uh, kind of train the model, saying this is the sample data, wherein yeah. we have detected it as fraud, and now you go figure out which other uh, transactions fit the same model. The other That's right. one where um, uh, it's kind of reverse engineering wherein you detect that, um, for example, this particular type of, uh, you give it lots of data and uh, based on, let's say, Splunk data, and you say that um, these are the uh, transactions uh, based on the case notes for each uh, for each call, uh, wherein they are, uh, these are potential fraud transactions, and you replicate back and say, okay, this is a potential fraud. So in the kind of reverse engineering model, is it feasible to uh, kind of garner what uh, an insight as to what is the logic that the model is using, which kind of predicates that this particular transaction is a fraudulent transactions? So the model is based on the, the Azure Cognitive Services functionality. Um, I don't know the exact logic behind how it does it, but mm -hmm. what I can tell you is that you need to train it. So if you train it incorrectly, even with subconscious bias, Mm -hmm. um, you'll get a bad result. So you basically need to find a bunch of records that, or case records that have been flagged as fraudulent, run those through the model, and then it'll learn based on what you previously taught it. So if mm -hmm. you say that um, this type of a case is a fraudulent case, if, if it sees more cases coming in of that type, it'll, autom it'll automatically flag it as fraudulent. Okay. Got yeah, it. it's it, it is it is down to the data though. If your data if you don't have good data, it's very unlikely that your model is going to be good. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Right. Got it. Thank you so much, and it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you. I am. Um, yeah. Normally, I can normally I can go for much longer, but I have another meeting, so I'm like <laughs> I have to rush a bit. Thank I appreciate you. that though. Cool. All right, folks. Any other questions? Well, feel free to. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop my um, Twitter my Twitter handle in the comments of the team. So uh, all you need to do is look for me here. I don't know my Twitter handle is called funny, but you got to deal with it. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you guys want to um, if you guys want to have a chat, give me a shout. I'd be more than happy to. Uh, I'd be more than happy to have a direct chat with you on Twitter. Cool. I'm assuming that's it. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Priyanka, thank you so much uh, for the invite. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I hope you all have an amazing day and hopefully chat to you soon. Yes. Hi, Chris. Your session was such a wonderful session and it was very informative. Thanks for being a speaker for our webinar series and hope we can have your one more webinar in future. Anytime. I promise not to be late next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. And uh, to the all the participants, thanks for joining the webinar. If you want this uh, recordings for of this webinar, just visit our YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Thanks. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.